The Betrayer. The Prime Usurper. Goratrix. This name is carried by an individual that is feared by many K-Knights in the modern Knights. The one responsible for turning an entire house of mages into blood-sucking monsters. Tonight, we are going to be discussing this iconic figure within Clan Tremere. His exploits, his actions, some history, and where he is in these modern nights. To fully grasp the nuanced figure that is Goratrix, we must delve into his past, his mortal life. As a mortal, Goratrix was in fact a mage. He had been discovered by Tremere in France. Goratrix was going to be put to the stake for heretical acts as his affinity for the true magics had been manifesting as visions and portents that he could not control. Tremere saw potential in the boy and decided to save him, introducing him into House Tremere, a great house within the Order of Hermes, a magic tradition amongst the Society of Mages. It did not take long for Gortrix to rise to the upper echelons of House Tremere. He had proven himself ambitious, talented, and very adept at the true magics. And in doing so, he eventually was able to position himself as the left hand of Tremere himself. In this, he had also developed a very bitter rivalry with a fellow Magus who had positioned himself as the right hand of Tremere. Another mage named Etrius, whose self-righteousness and overcautiousness caused Gortrix a lot of grief and disdain. In time, Gortrix's magical prowess grew, and he would later come to be the head of a consecration ritual for the grounds of Cheoris, a castle that was nestled within the Carpathian Mountains. This ritual was supposed to be a sort of sympathetic seeding ritual that would allow House Tremere to usurp the Vis within the soil so that they may use it for their own needs. Though the ritual itself would prove to be a little problematic. The Order of Hermes, and therefore House Tremere, practiced a lot of sympathetic magic, which means that the actions and things that they did during the rituals were representative of the outcomes that they wanted out of the magic ritual itself. And in doing so, Gortrix had to remove certain parts of himself and place it on the ground to represent a planting of a seed. I will let your imaginations run wild with that one. Unfortunately, due to the very complex magic ritual itself, all mages that were participating in this ritual had to remain steadfast and focused, yet one could not. A mage named Ponticulus. After Gortrix removed the piece from himself, Ponticulus could not bear the sight of the gushing blood and essentially lost himself. He started to vomit, he lost his focus, and the ritual was near botched. But Gortrix took the reins quickly and decided that to save the ritual itself, he would kill Ponticulus. With Tremere's blessing, Gortrix had Etrius take the same dagger that Gortrix had used to cut himself, to slit the throat of Ponticulus, and then later behead him. He would then take the piece that he had removed, put it in the mouth of Ponticulus's severed head, and place that into the ground, which would result in the ritual completing and becoming successful. You can understand why Ponticulus would later become a problem, as this particular action had actually bound Ponticulus's soul as a wraith to the grounds of Cheoris. But in doing so, Cheoris was now consecrated as the Prime Chantry for Tremere at this time. After the consecration of Cheoris, Tremere had proclaimed Gortrix to be the Lord of the Prime Chantry. 
much to the chagrin of Etrius. This proclamation had intensified the rivalry between Gortrix and Etrius to a greater degree. They had constantly vied for favor from their master, yet they really couldn't get one foot ahead of the other. They both possessed great skill and aptitudes in different things that complemented each other, and Tremere liked it this way. But eventually, things would change. Atreus discovered that the true magics of the world were waning, and the house's ability to manifest this magic was also weakening. While the mages themselves had already used magics and potions to extend their mortal lives, it was proclaimed that for them to truly be able to find a permanent solution to the waning true magics, they would need to find the secrets of immortality. Something that only one supernatural being had mastered the art of. The children of the night. The children of Cain. And so, Atreus and Gortrix were bid by their master Tremere to search far and wide and research as much as they could to try and find a solution for immortality. But in the end, Tremere had once again chosen Gortrix to spearhead this project due to his aptitude in ritual creation and performance. Magic is dying, and soon this sleeping world will cast away its memory like a fleeting dream. We shed one mortal manhood within the shadow of the world tree. We plant ourselves upon the roots of all creation, and cast our internal gaze Towards the heavens, we stare unblinking into the eyes of the Godhead, dwell upon the eternal power of the stars beyond. These words, spoken by Gortrix upon the climax of the ritual, still resonate within the blood of Altramir even to these nights. In 1022 CE, Gortrix was finally able to bear fruit for his efforts, though not without cost. Having grown ever more frustrated with stagnating results in search of solutions, despite having canine specimens on hand for experimentation, he submitted to the knowledge of ruinous powers as he did once before for the consecration of Cheoris. The powers of the root of all and stars beyond. He finally had the answers he sought after, and the ritual of usurpation was born. When all was ready, he called the fellow council members to Cheoris for the becoming. Upon the beginning of the ritual, it is said that for seven days and nights, Goratrix, Tremere, Etrius, Mirlinda, and four others close to Goratrix went without sleep and engaged in rituals so complex they covered over 1,000 leaves of parchment, each of which was burned in course of the ritual. Upon the ritual's climax, the council members set upon the embraced apprentices, Stefan and Ferris, childer to the Zemitsi Roland that Gortrix had previously captured, forced to embrace them, and subsequently put to final death. They took these apprentices and devoured them whole, flesh and blood, a cannibalistic event that would make the Nagaraja jealous. From violent delirium, they fell into a state of ecstatic agony that lasted hours. Then, they fell into unconsciousness. How long they were made in this torpid state is unknown, but when they awoke, they were fully-fledged canites in body and soul. Some say that the ritual was actually a potion that they all drank. 
a potion that could have been created using Stefan and Ferris, but I feel like these accounts are probably more accurate. None but Goratrix expected this result. Knowledge given to him by the Runa's powers, no doubt. The Spaniard Calderon lunged at Goratrix's throat, swearing to kill him for the misleading ritual. Etrius, appalled, accused Goratrix of diabolic meddling, to which he was correct, of course. Knowledge given to him by the Wraith Ponticulus, whom tried to warn the other members of the house of Goratrix's designs until Goratrix destroyed him a second time. Tremere, however, immediately sensed the efficacy of Gortrix's magic. Whether Tremere knew of the outcome or not is in contention, but I believe one as powerful as him couldn't have been so ignorant to the truth. Tremere spoke in that damnably commanding voice, the one that would make you forget all sense of decency, and ordered their other chantries to be ruled by Castellans in their stead. In the meantime... They stayed in Cheoris for seven years, struggling to make sense of their new existence and the new laws that governed their bodies. Their new undeath. Gortrix and the others became night-dwelling recluses, paranoid that the rest of their colleagues would discover the truth of their state. But none did. Typically, the other members of House Tremere were too engrossed in their own research to notice any change in the council. The newly turned could only scream into the void. The road to power for Goratrix after the becoming would be long, arduous, and full of threats and danger. But it was something that he would rise to, quite effectively. The becoming came with more than just life everlasting and a hungry beast. The Tzimitsi were not ignorant to what transpired in Cheoris. The destruction of the elder Roland and his two unwilling childer, the depraved experimentations that Tremere performed on many of their clanmates and others, and many other acts headed by Goratrix himself, would lead to an ongoing conflict known as the Omen War, a war that was spread across Europe that mostly were between Clan Tremere and Clan Zemitsi, though other clans of Canite society would join later on as they too were not ignorant to the Tremere's designs. During this time, Gortrix thought it prudent to sire several childer to be able to have tools and assets that he could use to further his own plans and, at the time, further the Tremere's stability. The first was Epistachia. She aided him in developing the ritual of usurpation with her skills in spiritual magic. That and her knowledge behind the truth of the ritual's inception were enough for Gortrix to embrace her within the first year of the initial turn. It is said that Apostasia's spiritual magic is how Gortrix was able to come into contact with the root of all and stars beyond. Later came Thermina, another promising mage brought into the house under Gortrix's tutelage. He embraced her a few years after becoming ever incessant on pestering him for him to share his secrets. Thermina sensed the change in Gortrix, and she wanted to know what was going on. Gortrix gave in, and eventually realized that Thermina would be an excellent tool that could be used against adversaries that do, grew too close to discovering the truth behind the house's change. And effective she was a veritable guard dog against the secrets that people yearned for. Several years later, he would embrace another mage named Malgorzata, another mage whom Gortrix personally tutored as well. Her boldness and quick rise won few friends, but won the admiration of other apprentices. She begged Gortrix to make her immortal like him, but Gortrix wasn't allowed to embrace outside the council at this time, as Tremere had proclaimed that they would slowly embrace the house Tremere. Instead, he broke a lesser rule and made her a ghoul. 
For decades, she begged him to lobby Tremere to her cause, finally gaining the embrace after 75 torturous years. The long wait made her bitter towards Tremere and towards Etrius, whom she blamed for her master's cautiousness. She would prove to be a very useful asset in the centuries to come. His last child was an elderly mage known as Orlando Oriundus, a liar and a charlatan that appraised his own magely skills highly. Though Gortrix knew he possessed skills in maneuvering through mortal circles and insight in social interactions, he may bluster and brag about his magely skills, but he did possess the skill to interact very well. Gortrix would embrace Orlando as an agent that would act as his eyes and ears within mortal society. The fates of Gortrix's childer widely differ as the centuries passed, but we aren't speaking about them tonight. Let's just say that most of his childer don't meet a super great end, but some of them manage to break the bonds. As the Omen War heightened in intensity, so too did Clan Tremere's need for power. It is said that when they discovered the Act of the Amaranth, they went on a spree of rampant diablerie, using rituals and other means to locate potent Elder Canites to take their power, Goratrix being chief among them. During this time, Clan Tremere developed their own brand of blood sorcery they deemed Thaumaturgy, a blend of hermetic practices and the use of Canite Vitae as its source of power. It is said Gortrix led the development of a great many paths of thaumaturgy that were used and later evolved into the modern knights, and then subsequently disappeared after the destruction of the Vienna Chentry. Over the next century, the Omen War with the Zemitsi continued on and off, with Tremere mages growing weaker and those newly embraced, unfamiliar with the powers of the blood. Chantries, as far as their stronghold in Ch of Cheoris, were repeatedly ravaged. While Tremere and Etrius pursued their own research throughout Europe in converting the Hermetic Arts into Thaumaturgy, Goratrix once again returned to his laboratories with his apprentices at hand. After years of experimentation on captured Zemitsi, Nosferatu, and Gangrel, he succeeded in creating the first gargoyle in 1121 with the help of Vistancia. And by 1125, the gargoyles were serving as shock troops against the fiends. This would prove to be a great tide turner in the Omen War. This is where information about Gortrix's exploits become a bit fractured and long periods of time go unrecorded. I've covered a lot about many of the Clan Tremere's history overall, simply because Gortrix played such a large role in these events. But this is where things split off a bit. Many years after the Tremere rose even more in power, after Tremere's diablerie of the antediluvian Salat of the Clan Salubri, Tremere bid Gortrix to further the clan's influence in the Paris courts. Many in the clan wondered why he chose Gortrix instead of Mir Linda for this task, who had already been entrenched in Canite society in attempts to elevate the Tremere's standing. But nonetheless, Gortrix did his former lover's bidding. He left Cheoris in 1133, leaving Malgorzata as his contact within Cheoris. He but soon learned, however, that the intricate politics of Paris were more to his liking than the secluded walls of the Tremere Fortress in Transylvania. While he conspired against Etrius, who had succeeded him as Lord of Cheoris, he involved himself in the politics of the French nobility, where Gortrix got into conflict with the Knights of the Temple of Solomon, otherwise known as the Knights Templar. His aims were to obtain information and physical ownership of ancient relics to further his knowledge and personal power. He was finally able to bring Philip the Fair to arrest the Templars in France around 1307, presumably by utilizing his child Orlando, who was skilled in 
mortal circles. Unfortunately for Goratrix, his plans failed, leaving a further stain on Clan Tremere and angering Tremere himself when he awoke from his slumber. He recognized that he had made a mistake sending Goratrix to France, and also discovered that he how somehow must have been manipulated into doing so. Tremere doesn't make mistakes. He summoned Gortrix to Cheoris to be punished for his ambitions. But in a panic, Gortrix fled, leaving his clan behind, sensing his assassination was imminent. This is why Gortrix earned the moniker of Betrayer. His ambitions led to a loss of favor from Tremere despite all his achievements. He was now an apostate of the clan. There is some speculation that this was planned by Tremere as a way to implant an agent with the future Sabbat, but since Gortrix was shunned long before the Convention of Thorns, this is unlikely to be the case, unless Tremere could somehow foresee the future. Centuries passed and the neonates continued to defy their elders. While the Tremere were more tightly knit, they were not immune to dissatisfied clan members. Gortrix took this opportunity to discreetly build his own power base with what would be the future Tremere Anti-Tribune. Around the 18th century, it was discovered that the rumors of Gortrix joining the Sabbat were true. Gortrix was successful in garnering power and supplanted himself in the sect within the New World, making him and the Anti-Tribune marked for destruction by the clan proper. Gortrix founded House Gortrix within the Sabbat and structured it like the main clan's pyramid in a mocking irony. His personal chantry would be stationed in Mexico City, the premier Sabbat stronghold, and House Gortrix would become a major power within the sect, despite being marked for death. House Gortrix would be marked by a T on their body if they partook in the Valdery. A curse Gortrix could not undo despite his power, but it did not deter him from seeking to further elevate his house. The ultimate fate of Gortrix is at hand. In 1999, Tremere lost his centuries-long battle of wills with Saulot. However, he had a contingency. He either manipulated, convinced, forced, or already planned with Gortrix to undergo a transference. Tremere implanted his own soul into Gortrix's body when Saulot expelled him from his own, and in turn implanting Gortrix into a mirror. Tremere, under the guise of Gortrix, would summon all of the anti tribu to Mexico City where they would all be reduced to ash by Tremere in an attempt to maintain his power by an unknown ritual. At this point, Gortrix and the Tremere Anti-Tribu were known to be destroyed and Tremere vanished. Almost 20 years later, House Gortrix would rise again. In 2018, admits the aftermath of the Tremere Pyramid collapsing, resulting in many splinter houses of the Tremere. This new house, Gortrix, would align with the Camarilla this time around, but to what end, no one knows. Is Gortrix at the head of this new version of his house? Finding a way to escape the mirror into a new body, or merely controlling it through this parallel realm? Or has Tremere returned to lead this house in Gortrix's body, and seeks to rebuild the clan in a new way? We cannot be sure... But one thing is certain. The betrayer is cunning and capable. If his house has returned, you can be certain it is a dark portent of things to come.